While Spider-Man saw success on the Sega Genesis with Spider-Man vs The Kingpin and Maximum Carnage on the Genesis and Super Nintendo, the character wouldn't gain overwhelming critical praise until it was owned by Activision, who launched with the 2000 hit which was available on all the major systems of the time. Not only did this game successfully propel the series into 3D, but it is also fondly remembered by many to be one of their more standout Spider-Man experiences. While Neversoft developed the first game, its sequel was handed to Vicarious Visions. Enter Electro just didn't seem to do quite as well, and with that came the end of this first Activision continuity as the next step for the series was onto the new generation to coincide with the upcoming Spider-Man movie adaptation. Development of Spider-Man video games was took over by Treyarch, who previously handled the Sega Dreamcast port of 2000's Spider-Man. The next release came out one year after Enter Electro and was once again simply named Spider-Man, starting a new movie continuity. It released for PC and all the major consoles of the time, including the PlayStation 2, Xbox, Nintendo GameCube and Game Boy Advance. Spider-Man 2002 is another mission-based 3D action game that actually has many similarities to the previous two Spider-Man games in its controls and web-swinging mechanic. Now the levels are much larger, making great use of the new console's hardware capabilities. The web-swinging once again has your line stick to the sky above you, and Spidey just completes his swinging animation without any interruption from velocity or momentum, making it still feel pretty much automatic. However, you're no longer limited to the distance that you can swing, allowing Spidey to now swing across the levels to his heart's content. This has been taken advantage of in some of the new air battles, which as you go up against foes in the skies above New York, or often tasks you to chase them. The size of the levels made Treyarch create a new height indicator that tells you the height of where your next objective is, which works in conjunction with the returning Spidey Compass. However, you can't reach the ground as swinging past a certain height will cause you to fall and get a game over, but you can now see the bustling New York traffic beneath you. Spider-Man's arsenal is very much the same with what we've seen so far. You can wall crawl and perform some of his web-based abilities such as the Web Dome. But in some areas there have been much bigger improvements, such as the web zip, which now allows you to quickly zip up buildings when you're crawling up them, or zip forward on the ground to get to places faster, as well as still being able to web zip to the ceiling above you, which is still very handy. Web projectiles can now be fired a lot quicker, and whilst you're battling in the skies. You will be using your web projectiles a lot more to defeat certain enemies and bosses. Secondly, Spider-Man's attack moves have been majorly expanded upon, with there now being a whole set of 21 combos to utilise in taking down your foes in various ways. You may even find some of the new combos when picking up the secret gold spider emblems that are hidden in the levels. Some indoor stages also feature deeper stealth mechanics, now letting you hide within the darkness of the levels, with the game using the spidey icon in the top corner of the screen to indicate when you're invisible to your enemies. Each level ends with an arcade-like score screen, giving you points based on a number of factors such as finding all the secrets, defeating all the enemies, completing the level in a certain amount of time, etc. You can then use these points later in the extras menu to purchase the game's numerous unlockables. So Spider-Man 2002 was the first in a new movie timeline, and it's also the first video game to tackle Spider-Man's origins. Peter Parker, now voiced by Tobey Maguire, has only recently been bitten by the radioactive spider that gifts him incredible powers. He was raised by his Aunt May and Uncle Ben in Queens, New York but the last time Peter saw his Uncle Ben, they argued. He took out his frustration at a wrestling match in which he planned to use his new strength and agility to earn money. Later, when collecting what he was owed for the fight, the promoter cheated him. So when a thug comes and robs the promoter, Peter stands aside and does nothing to help. But in doing so, when the thief escapes and Peter makes his way outside, he finds his Uncle Ben has been murdered shot during a carjacking. Peter, wearing his wrestling outfit, goes on a hunt to find the man who murdered his Uncle Ben, overhearing on the police radio that the killer was the leader of the Skulls gang. 
You scale the rooftops of New York City, battling members of the Skulls Gang. You get clues that the leader of the Skulls Gang, your Uncle Ben's killer, is running a warehouse at the docks, so you head over there to battle him. Spike acts as the first boss battle and is equipped with flash grenades and a very powerful shotgun. However, using the darkness and your faster reflexes, he's easily taken down. Peter now realises he was the same burglar who was at the wrestling match. He fills up with guilt, knowing now that he could have done something that would have prevented his uncle being killed. Spike trips over his feet and he falls out of the warehouse window to his death, with Peter being robbed of his vengeance. But he remembers Uncle Ben's words when they last spoke. Where there is great power, there must also come great responsibility. Using these words, Peter vows to use his powers for good. Luckily, Peter had close friends Mary Jane and Harry Osborn who stuck by him. Harry's father, Norman Osborn, voiced by Willem Dafoe, rented Harry and Peter an apartment in New York City. And Peter started a freelance photography position at the Daily Bugle newspaper, recognised for his pictures of Spider-Man. Meanwhile, at Norman Osborn's technology and research company, Oscorp, they are in the process of manufacturing military-grade serum to enhance its soldiers, and technology that involves a flying glider. To complete the serum, Osborn realises that they need Spider-Man's DNA as the final ingredient, so they plan to get it by using his latest hunter-killer robots. Meanwhile, Spider-Man's first run-in with supervillains comes in the form of a jewellery heist from Vulture and the Shocker. Spidey arrives too late as the two criminals flee the scene. Spidey webs Shocker's van, causing him to retreat into Grand Central Station. The Shocker is the first supervillain that we face. We chase Shocker all the way down into the subway tunnels, battling his henchmen along the way. We eventually catch up to him, and straight away it's evident that this is a much bigger set piece than his boss fight in Enter Electro. You first got a dodgy sonic waves that he blasts down the train tunnels, and then we battle him in an arena. Shocker then gives away Vulture's location, and Spidey travels to an abandoned clock tower to find him. Inside, Vulture ambushes Spidey, and rigs the tower to explode. Spider-Man climbs to the top, escaping the steadily rising fire and dodging Vulture's grenades. Once you reach the top, you battle him in the skies above New York City. The Vulture uses an assortment of attacks, such as firing razor-sharp feathers from his wings. He's a great villain to demonstrate the new air combat system that the game implements. Once Vulture is defeated, he's webbed up and he's saved for the police. Oscorp later finds a reading of another arachnid character in New York that being Mac Gargan, aka Scorpion. He's being chased by the Oscorp drones that want his DNA, and so Spider-Man assists him in destroying them. However, Scorpion, being paranoid, thinks Spidey is also from Oscorp and battles him as well. Spidey takes down Scorpion, but he manages to escape. After multiple delays, Oscorp threatens to fire Norman Osborn. And so in anger and frustration, Osborn plans to test his super soldier serum before it can be completed. In a turn of events, the serum leads to the creation of Norman's twisted second personality, and he dons his experimental suit and glider and attacks New York as the Green Goblin. Currently, there is a festival happening in New York, to which Mary Jane has attended. But when Goblin attacks, Spider-Man must rescue Mary Jane, who is trapped on an inflatable panda. When he saves her, she gives Spider-Man a kiss, which an Oscorp hunter drone takes a picture of. Spider-Man then battles Green Goblin across the skies of New York, however, Old Gobby makes an escape, leaving Spidey to disarm the bombs that he has planted across the rooftops. This next chapter is only playable on the Xbox version of Spider-Man. It involves Norman Osborn hiring the legendary hunter Craven to take down Spider-Man for good. Liking a good challenge, Craven the Hunter lights up a spider tower on fire to ensnare Spidey into his trap at the Central Park Zoo. Spidey arrives, taking the bait, and is poisoned by a deadly gas. Weakened, Spider-Man still manages to best Craven's house of traps and even dodges his bullets in a second-person section shown from Craven's scope. When Craven is defeated, he gives Spidey the antidote for the poison gas out of respect of his prey having beaten him. 
After his battle with the Green Goblin, Peter deciphers from one of his throwable devices that he must work for Oscorp, whereas Norman looks over the photos that his robots have taken and makes the conclusion that Mary Jane has a connection with Spider-Man. So as Spidey infiltrates Oscorp for clues, Gobby heads out to kidnap Mary Jane. At Oscorp, Spidey finds out that they're working on experimental chemical weapons. Spidey shuts the project down and then makes it into Norman's office where he finds the photographs of MJ. Spidey then chases Green Goblin through the skies of New York, but Goblin drops MJ on top of the Queensboro Bridge. Spider-Man rescues Mary Jane first and then has his final showdown with the Green Goblin. In the end, Gobby removes his helmet to show Spider-Man his true identity, and Peter is shocked to learn that this supervillain has been his best friend's father all along. Norman almost tricks Spider-Man into getting killed by his glider from behind. However, Spidey's super senses and reflexes save him from the glider, which hits Norman instead at high speed. In his dying breath, he tells Spider-Man to tell Harry that he's sorry. Mary Jane arrives to thank Spider-Man and hints that she may already know about his secret identity, but this was likely an oversight with the movie and the game both being in production at the same time. Completing the game on various difficulty levels unlocks you different costumes and a whole new playable character. As for extra costumes, there is the wrestler outfits that he wears at the beginning, plain clothes Peter Parker, and the Alex Ross prototype outfit for the movie, which also appeared as an unlockable costume in the previous Enter Electro. This was a concept design for Spider-Man that was going to appear in the movie until it was changed. But what's awesome about this Alex Ross outfit is it also changes Green Goblin into his early concept Alex Ross design with the hood and the changed mask and it just looks great. Completing the game on hard unlocks the ability to even play as Green Goblin. But unlike the other costumes, Goblin has a whole new set of moves replacing the web swinging, wall crawling and web based attacks with Oscorp technology such as throwable pumpkin bombs, razor bats and of course access to the glider that lets you fly around the levels, fire the machine guns and shoot missiles from it. But not only does the moveset change, but also does the narrative with this Green Goblin being Harry Osborn, who takes up the costume and glider after his father's death and goes on an investigation to find out more about his father's death, with all the voice lines voiced by Tobey Maguire having been changed now for Harry Osborn taking over as the lead character. The story is designed as an alternate turn of events, much like the what-if modes from the previous two games, rather than an epilogue to the main game as it's not canon. But it's also a cool foreshadowing of the events of the future third entry in the series, where Harry Osborn does go down the Goblin path. I'd certainly say that this has more replay value than the what if modes, as battling through the same levels and bosses, but now as a whole different character, the Green Goblin, is a really great feature. And even has you battle Green Goblin, just like the main story, except now it's another mysterious person who was apparently hired by Norman before his death to dispose of Spider-Man, likely hinting at Hobgoblin. Now if you want a reason to play the game a third or even fourth time, there are more bonuses to discover in the form of cheat codes. There's a whole range of various skins to unlock that offer no gameplay changes like the Green Goblin does, or different voice lines, but still are cool extras. You can change Spider-Man to look like the Shocker, Spike, Mary Jane even, or a bunch of NPC models such as gang members or police officers. There is also a cheat that unlocks a first person view mode, allowing you to experience the whole game through the eyes of Spider-Man himself, making this the first ever first person Spider-Man game. As for Spider-Man on the Game Boy Advance, this port was handled by Digital Eclipse, who have worked on many Game Boy games, some of which we've covered already, like Batman Chaos in Gotham and Mortal Kombat 4. This is very much your classic 2D side-scrolling action experience, following roughly the same plot as the console version, just in a slightly different order. You battle in this order Vulture, then you battle Kraven, then Shocker, then Scorpion, and finally Green Goblin. You can web swing, 
fire web projectiles, do new web tricks like swinging around a pole, and throw web grenades. The presentation is really well made, with neat animations and comic book onomatopoeic words that spring onto the screen when you hit your foes. It even has these pseudo 3D web swinging stages which are incredible to see on the Game Boy Advance. Spider-Man 2002 was another critical and financial hit from Activision, proving they had what it takes to keep Spider-Man as a popular IP in the world of video games. When it released, many outlets considered this one of the best Spider-Man games, only receiving criticism for minor camera issues, short length, and voice acting from Tobey Maguire. However, the combat enhancements, the graphics, the broad levels, and the range of extras make this a Spidey game that you just couldn't pass up on. Spider-Man went on to sell close to 4 million copies across all of its platforms, with 2.1 million being on the PlayStation 2 alone. This gross combined sales of over a hundred million dollars, becoming one of the best-selling games of 2002 and marking Spider-Man as one of Activision's greatest franchises.